Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. I'm Shelley Hawks and I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Transcendentalism Council of First Parish in Concord, Massachusetts. Our group plans and presents events that educate and celebrate the people and events that made Concord uh, a center of American independence and imagination. So we're delighted to welcome Dr. Sandy Petrolinus, the author of To Set This World Right, the Anti-Slavery Movement in Thoreau's Concord, as well as many other works on Thoreau, Transcendentalism, and other 19th century figures. She is the Distinguished Professor of English in American Studies at Pennsylvania State University in Altoona and serves as the director of the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institutes based in Concord. And in fact, there was a two-week institute uh, this past summer. So uh, that uh, this past summer, the topic for that summer institute was transcendentalism and social reform, activism and community engagement in the age of Thoreau. So her current work includes a biography of author reformer Thomas Wentworth Higginson, and with Noelle Baker, the Almanacs of Mary Moody Emerson, a scholarly digital edition. Okay, so a few uh, logistics here. Um, if you check the chat feature right now, you will see uh, some more information regarding our future events, and we have some exciting ones coming up. Saturday, October 22nd at 3 p.m., uh, David Hackett Fisher will talk about his book, uh, African Founders, his new book, and that's part of the Concord Festival of Authors, and I have a link there. The registration's not quite open yet. And then Monday, November 14th, uh, online, we will have uh, Dr. Sarah Ann Wider, who will be giving a lecture on um, Carolyn Sturgis Tappan. Okay, so that's enough for me, but uh, I'd like to pass it to our speaker, Dr. Petrolinus, and also let our viewers know that uh, after her presentation, we will have um, about 20 minutes of questions. So I hope that you will uh, uh, be very active in putting your questions uh, in the chat feature, please, and we will field those for you. All right, uh, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shelley, and the First Parish Transcendentalism Council for inviting me to talk with you today. It's always a pleasure, as some of you may know, uh, to speak about one of my favorite Concord residents. I'm going to share screen right now, which I hope will work. And um, someone among you, please give a shout if you're not seeing a slide right now. Hopefully you are. I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to take that as a positive. Uh, Everything's fine. Okay, good. And it should be, it should have just advanced to a photograph. So if that's occurred, we're, we're in good shape. Um, as I said, it's always a pleasure to talk about Mary Merrick Brooks. Some 180 years ago, uh, before Senator Elizabeth Warren from your state became identified with the expression, nevertheless, she persisted. It was another progressive Massachusetts woman who was doing the same thing. Mary Mary Brooks nevertheless persisted. And I'm thrilled to know that there are opportunities like this today to keep talking about her and hopefully that will continue. Uh, to keep me on track and to be mindful of the time today, certainly to make sure there's time for questions, I'm mainly going to read and talk a little bit as I read, but going unscripted can be pretty dangerous for me. So I, I'm going to try very much to, to keep to our time and make sure we have time for questions. What you will hear also will be the words of Mary Brooks herself quite often. And certainly she speaks far more passionately about her subject than I can. For those who aren't familiar with her, let me introduce you quickly to Mary Merrick Brooks, the daughter of Sa Sally Minot and Tilly Merrick, this Concord native appears in her earliest letters, largely as a social matter. Prevailing interests for her were a social life, fashions, flirtatious young men. Um, 19th century historian of Concord, 
Edward Jarvis considered her the most beautiful lady in town. At age 22, though, in 1823, she settles down and marries widow widower Nathan Brooks, 16 years her senior, a respected lawyer and an aspiring politician, whose reform sympathies, though, were, in the words of Boston abolitionist Anne Weston, as good as his social standing will permit. Her parentage may figure in Brooks's transition from a local bell to Concord's leading anti-slavery reformer. Sally Minot, her mother, was very active in charity work locally, but her father, Tilly Merrick, who had grown up in Concord, ended up as a young man working in his stepfather's maritime trade business. This occupation eventually led to Tilly Merrick owning and apparently mismanaging an agricultural operation outside Charleston, South Carolina. That was work certainly by enslaved laborers. He returned to Concord years later, married Sally Minot and opened a small dry goods shop. We can't know of course whether or the extent to which their daughter, Mary Merrick, atoning for the sins of her father motivated Brooks's reformist zeal later in life, but certainly I think it's a reasonable speculation for us. Like many of her contemporaries in the anti-slavery movement, both in Concord and other towns, Brooks shared a Christian fervor in her words, to do something mighty, to tremble, an earthquake, burst a volcano, to attract attention to the cause. Her unpublished correspondence spanning over 20 years establishes that particularly during the 1840s, Brooks was the center of a wide ranging epistolary network that put Concord ultimately in the history books as a hotbed of abolitionism. During the decades preceding the Civil War, she not only directed the local female anti-slavery society, she held leadership positions in the county society right next to the male leaders. With other Concord women, she attended state and national conventions for anti-slavery in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. Fellow reformers admired her relentless drive, but they were also honest in assessing her personality. Boston abolitionist Wendell Phillips, for one, valued Brooks for being, quote, frank almost to bluntness, for speaking her whole thought, and for not allowing her tenderness of affection to ever confuse her judgment. That just, that seems like a marvel of, um, of discretion in the way that he describes her there. My research over the past several years has examined Brooks's role at the helm of the Female Anti-Slavery Society, which she and other women, some 60 of them, founded in Concord in October, 1837. I've discussed specific scenarios and strategies that enabled her network to succeed in persuading her neighbor and friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, to broaden his transcendentalist emphasis on self-reform to accommodate public action. Aligning Emerson with the nation's radical abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips was Brooks's primary mission, and she pursued it thoughtfully and persistently. Scholars have long pointed out that, quote, Emerson's reputation as America's leading intellectual gave any participation in reform movements enormous power and impact. Certainly, this was the 19th century understanding as well. In a signal example of her networking strategy to bring influential figures to her cause, Brooks naturally enough set her sights on Emerson. The network in my title today signifies connections with others locally, in person, in their correspondence, as well as the official channels of state, national, and local reform organizations through which Brooks and others communicated. Concerted networks like this could, should certainly be understood to comprise a reform underworld of sorts, sometimes coded and with a corollary, corollary mission of prodding, goading, and when required, even shaming illustrious figures like Emerson to put action behind their social reform principles to, as I like to put it, accept the responsibility of their reputations. <laughs> 
first, we need to appreciate just how Brooks perceived herself Emerson's importance to the anti-slavery movement. So I'm going to shoot forward to 1846, and then I'll come back to the 1830s. In an appeal to his wife, Lydian Jackson Emerson, Brooks put it eloquently. I want great names for this cause, for almost all the anti-slavery treasure is in earthen vessels. And though a diamond is as much a diamond in an old crockery bowl as in a golden vase, yet men can much more readily be made to look for the diamond in the vase. If Mr. Emerson shall see fit to sign the petition, please ask him to put it at the head. It is seldom we get such coin. And when we do, I am anxious to make it pass for all it is worth. You should now be looking at a slide with Emerson with a manuscript letter and with a quotation typed as well. So again, Shelley, if this isn't working and the slides have for some reason stopped showing, please let me know. I'll slide. Okay, good, thank you. This letter was followed by one addressed to Waldo Emerson himself both of which reveal Brooks at perhaps her most emboldened. By 1846, it was nearly a decade into her reign as Concord's abolitionist in charge, and she could take pride in many accomplishments. Well-known orators like Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and Wendell Phillips lectured in Concord courtesy of her invitations. What was known as the schism between the new orgs and the old orgs that divided anti-slavery societies in 1839 and 1840 was effectively squashed in Concord, thanks to her insistent support for Garrison's old orgs. We can talk more about that um, schism if anyone has questions. But most important to Brooks, through her reform network, she was, and I don't exaggerate a bit, single-handedly responsible for the radicalization of Waldo Emerson. I'm going to focus this afternoon on three key episodes of her campaign for Emerson that present her reform network in action. First, the 1838 protests regarding the Cherokee people. Second, her efforts in 1844 to secure Emerson as a speaker at a significant anti-slavery gathering that summer in Concord. And third, her principal role in 1845 that led Emerson to cancel a scheduled lecture in New Bedford when the Lyceum there adopted a segregated seating policy. Although these are only three episodes over the decades of her reform activism in Concord, they reveal the enormity of Brooks's sense of mission and they also expose her behind the scenes tactics at their best. Brooks's extant correspondence comprises some 40 letters housed in three primary institutions, the Concord Free Public Library, the Weston Sisters Anti-Slavery Collection at Boston Public Library, and the Houghton Library at Harvard in the Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Wendell Phillips papers. In a recent project I'm undergoing to compile and edit Brooks's correspondence on reform topics. I've been reminded though of two letters in another collection, which offer an early example of her setting her sights on Emerson. In the Adams Family Papers at Boston Public Library are two missives from Brooks to Congressman John Quincy Adams in 1838, addressing the plight of the Cherokee people, a humanitarian crisis that escalated shortly after the female anti-slavery society had been organized and conquered. President Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act had been passed eight years before, spawning immediate protests throughout the country. In 1835, a few Cherokee men had gone against the popular will of their nation and signed the New Echota Treaty, in which they accepted terms for the Cherokees' relocation, acting without permission on behalf of thousands of their people. Denounced as an atrocious fraud, the treaty nevertheless gave Mar President Martin Van Buren the rationale he needed to begin the eviction process. The forced march of thousands led to the tragedy now known as the Trail of Tears, which commenced in November 1838. As did many Northerners who were outraged by this injustice, 
con conquered reformers held what they called an indignation meeting in April 1838. They spoke out against the illegitimate treaty and signed a petition urging Congress to revoke it. Waldo Emerson lent his voice and his signature to this effort, although Lydian Emerson confided the next day to her sister that he very unwillingly takes part in moment, movements like that publicly. For their part, Lydian, Mary Brooks, and over 200 other conquered women, including Emerson's 70-year-old mother, Ruth Haskins Emerson, submitted their own petition to Congress. And what at least Portnoy regards as the quote, first announced instance of women's federal activism in the public sphere, this and other female anti-removal petitions prayed that the treaty made with the Cherokees at Nuichota may not be enforced. Many of these signatories had been relishing their activist identity since organizing the Female Anti-Slavery Society, including three generations of the African-American Garrison family in Concord. Here you see the names of mother and daughter, both named Susan, and 15-year-old Ellen Garrison, as well as Ellen's friend from Boxborough, 21-year-old Emmeline Chester. Ellen's reform resume would go on to include teaching freed people in Virginia and Maryland, where in 1866, she brought suit against the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad for its segregated policies and racist mistreatment. If you haven't visited the Robbins House already in Concord, please do so as soon as you can uh, to learn more about this impressive young activist as well as her family. Proud of Concord and honing her own networking skills, Lydian Emerson urged her sister in Plymouth to coordinate a similar indignation meeting. Every town that does not raise a voice must share the disgrace and the blame, she said. Lydian also discerns that as in Concord, women in Plymouth will likely lead the charge. Speak to Mary Russell, Jane Goodwin, Mrs. Briggs, that they may mention to the gentleman most likely to care that something be done. Until recently, most scholars had credited unnamed neighbors or Concord citizens for Emerson's willingness to speak at the Concord indignation meeting. Emerson himself says only that a sad friend brought him the news about this disaster of the Cherokees. But the unpublished correspondence of petition signer Prudence Ward makes clear who was responsible. Last night, I attended a small party at Mrs. Brooks. She is in great trouble about the Indians and has written Miss Grimke to ask her advice about it, to inquire if she cannot introduce the subject in her lectures. She wants to talk to Mr. Emerson to see if he will not set the men to work and I promise to go with her tomorrow morning for that purpose. She says that if no one else will do it, she shall write to J.Q. Adams herself. In another letter, Brooks, or excuse me, Ward positions Brooks as, quote, the principal mover in all that's been done. Here, Ward lays out the ambitious reach of Brooks's networking, beyond Emerson even. First, Brooks appeals to abolitionist speaker Angelina Grimke whom she had recently met in Concord and whom she knew wielded considerable influence in national reform circles. Further, Brooks not only confidently seeks Grimke's counsel as to her own steps, a little bit of flattery, but then also urges Grimke to broaden her lectures to include the Cherokee situation. Next, Brooks moves to secure Emerson who ideally will persuade other prominent townsmen to speak at the meeting. This bold multitasking, we might call it, never abated. In the days immediately following, Brooks and Emerson both sent letters of protest to elected officials. In Emerson's case, an open letter to President Martin Van Buren that was published in the Washington Daily Intelligencer on May 14, 1838. In Brooks's case, it was a private plea to Representative John Quincy Adams, whom she knew as one of the, as one of the most strident congressional voices announcing removal 
Emerson's respectful letter to the United States president addresses the news about the, quote, sinister rum rumors, excuse me, concerning the Cherokee people. Quote, we have witnessed with sympathy the painful endeavors of these red men to redeem their own race from the doom of eternal inferiority and to borrow and domesticate in the tribe the inventions and customs of the Caucasian race. Emerson felt such a reprehensible plan as eviction would really deprive us as well as the Cherokees of a country. While he's desirous not, quote, to overstep the bounds of decorum, Emerson beseeches Van Buren to reconsider the policy. He questions whether the president will in fact persist in this infamy or whether, quote, justice will be done by the race of the civilized to the race of the savage man. He reminds him how well the Cherokees have assimilated into mainstream white society. He remarks on the Cherokees' worth and civility. He praises their improvements in social arts, and he notes their newspapers and attendance at our schools and colleges. Thus, in a letter, acceptance of the Cherokees seems based on erasure of their difference. As Len Gudgeon and others have long explained, at this time, Emerson remained unconvinced of the possibility for racial equality, holding to a theory of great men needed to effect historical change. He did not believe that indigenous Americans nor African Americans had proven themselves yet the equals, quote, of this dynasty of the Caucasians and Saxons. As he considered in 1840, his friend Sarah Clark's remark that ultimately the Indians will, quote, perish because there is no place for them, Emerson agrees with her, but he takes it a step further. That is the very fact of their inferiority, he says, there is always place for the superior. Let us recognize then the distance from where Emerson is as a reformer versus where Brooks desires him to be. In his journal, Emerson related his distress over this step into these politically troubled waters. Writing to Van Buren, he considered, quote, a letter hated of me. I write my journal, I read my lecture with joy, but this stirring and the philanthropic mud gives me no peace. I will let the Republic alone until the Republic comes to me. What he didn't count on, I'm quite sure, was the Republic pounding repeatedly on his door in the form of Mary Merrick Brooks. Not surprisingly, Brooks's letter to Congressman Adams differs substantially from Emerson's to Van Buren, particularly in the personal appeal of its tone. In place of Emerson's more tepid protest and circumspect tone are Brooks's dramatic soul-bearing pleas for human sympathy. Her letter also showcases techniques on which Brooks will rely in her abolitionist crusade, apologetic but confident persistence, feminine wiles, and even self-deprecation, all of which aim to shame men into action. Proudly presenting herself as one of a band of women, emphatically women, who take the liberty to address you, Brooks implores Adams to take decisive action. She and other women would do so, she ensures him, were we differently situated. But as it is, we are doing all that we can as women. She acknowledges that their recent anti-slavery labors had caused the plight of the poor Indians to fade from our minds and prays to be forgiven for this most hearing sin. Sharing in the pain of the about to be expatriated Cherokees, Brooks draws on the antebellum rhetoric of sympathy. We now speak of the poor Indians. We have placed ourselves in their stead. We feel what it must be to them to leave those dear homes, to be driven to a far off land with little or no prospect before them. We come with our suffering brothers and sisters and request you to cast your eyes over the vast amount of agony which bends before you. She concludes the letter by yearning for Congressman Adams to quote, be our Moses. If not, the women's hope is to be frustrated. Our souls will be quiet in God 
and we will wait the glorious unfoldings of his providence. Here we see another of Brooks's common rhetorical ploys, adopting the pose of a patient Christian martyr, trusting to God's plan. A second more brief missive from Brooks to Adams accompanies a second Concord women's petition. This one submitted in late December 1838, as headlines were daily reporting on the human tragedy unfolding in the southeastern United States. I herewith send you the prayers of a small company of unsphered women. Were we permitted, we would humbly inform the honorable body of which you are a member, how ardently we long to return to those simple but delightful duties for which God and nature so evidently designed us, those of knitting, spinning, mending hose, making puddings, etc., etc. But which we can by no means do be the consequences what they may to ourselves until our prayers are heard and answered. Now, given that Brooks has at this time been spearheading a busy anti-slavery agenda, and given that her name will appear just a few years down the road on a call for the Worcester Women's Rights Convention, one must suspect the reliability of this statement. Further, in her striking reference to unsphered women, Brooks aligns herself and other Concord women activists, again with Angelina Grimke, whose firm rebukes of critics, including well-known educator Catherine Beecher, had recently been published. To Beecher's judgment that women should are exceeding their so-called domestic sphere by speaking in public on anti-slavery, Grimke had countered, nothing which concerns the well-being of mankind is either beyond woman's sphere or above her com comprehension, excuse me. The local newspapers in Concord ran vastly different editorials on the subject of, Concord, or of Cherokee removal. In late May 1838, the Concord Freeman reported that the native people who had already relocated in Western territories were, quote, content and happy. Its editor referred to Cherokee opposition leader John Ross as, quote, a cunning half-breed and counseled readers to reject a false sympathy with the fancied wrongs of the Cherokee Nation. In contrast, the Yeoman's Gazette headlines reported on Cherokee wrongs and the plunder of the Cherokees. The Gazette also published Emerson's letter to Van Buren a few days after it appeared in the Daily Intelligencer. William Lloyd Garrison soon published it as well in his abolitionist Liberator prefacing it with a hopeful note that Emerson's mind and heart would likewise soon also be affected by the woes of the slaves, a reminder that surely reinvigorated Brooks's continued targeting of Emerson. Concord Reformer's brief campaign on behalf of the Cherokee people offers an instructive window on both the breadth and the inner workings of Mary Merritt Brooks's early reform network a decisive spoke of which continued to be fixated on Emerson. Over the next few years, she took on leadership roles in the Middlesex County Anti-Slavery Society, attending meetings in nearby towns, one of which in nearby Groton led her to meet and invite the young Frederick Douglass to speak in Concord, which he did for the first time in October 1841. Repeatedly, Brooks solicits Boston female anti-slavery society leader, Mariah Weston Chapman, um, to help her in securing the best speakers for Concord. I do hope Wendell Phillips will come at more than any other person. I want to be able to publish in the papers that Wendell Phillips will deliver a lecture in the evening. I try to trust in God. When things go contrary to my wishes, my abolition trials are my hardest. These trials surely included Emerson's steadfast reluctance to appear on the anti-slavery lecture platform. As late as his lecture on New England reformers in early 1844, Emerson not only held fast to his notion of transcendentalist self-reform, but he also generally der derided the offensiveness of the class of ultra reformers. 
Brooks had in these years turned her attention to others, yet she never ever ceased focusing on Emerson. Her correspondence during the early 1840s reflects a letter writing flurry, repeatedly inviting Wendell Phillips and other leading figures, but also letting them know of the community opposition to their showing up and speaking. And though she succeeded more often than not in securing them, by the summer of 1844, she must indeed have been elated on the one hand, when her efforts at last paid off and Emerson agreed to speak at the Female Society celebration of the 10th anniversary of West Indian emancipation. Similar August 1st gatherings were scheduled across New England, but as usual, Brooks wanted Concord not only to boast the biggest names, but to draw the biggest crowds. So on the other hand, were her own and others' concerns that Emerson might not prove as resolute an abolitionist as they desired. Just to go off script for a moment, uh, I encourage you guys who are teachers in the audience to show these letters, the excerpts, um, doubting that Emerson will be the best speaker on the subject. Because when you're teaching Emerson, especially if you use something like the Norton Anthology or another anthology that's got the major speeches that he eventually gives on anti-slavery, um, they come out perfect, of course, and they're, they're excellent speeches, but students have no idea that 10 and 15 years earlier, he wasn't considered among those who might be the best speaker on this subject, that there were concerns. And it was a gradual process for him to reach that point. There, the students are just amazed um, when you put this in front of them, which of course I love to do. In addition to these anxieties, the doors to Concord venues were now firmly shut by 1844 to anti-slavery speakers. None of the churches, and I'm sorry to say that includes the first parish, welcome them. And though Nathaniel and Sophia Hawthorne kindly offered the use of the old manse's spacious lawn, the day's rain removed that option. Thus, Emerson ended up speaking in the less than idyllic space of Concord's municipal building, as Anne Whiting related it and the Herald of Freedom, we took the courthouse. Despite these circumstances, and regardless of his continued misgivings about reform movements in general, Emerson delivered a two and a half hour speech that day that is universally regarded as his coming out address as an abolitionist his words assuring the abolitionists of his alliance with their cause. Anne Whiting marked, quote, the sublime moment. Emerson descended among us, grasps our hands and says, I have come to enter with you into this holy war. I love Robert Gross's characterization of this speech in his, his, in his new book. He says, Emerson assumed the abolitionist platform without succumbing to the rhetorical excesses he feared. It's beautifully put. And Waldo, or excuse me, William Lloyd Garrison agreed 100%. He deemed the speech merely satisfactory and able and contrasted it with the other better forcible addresses in Concord that were given that day by Frederick Douglass and others. But to Brooks, far more important than the words Emerson spoke this day was that he delivered them. In its annual report later that year, the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society recorded that at Concord, a meeting was held in the courthouse as no meeting house could be obtained for the occasion but an address of singular beauty and eloquence was delivered to the audience by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Additionally, Brooks presented Emerson with a medal on behalf of the American Anti-Slavery Society. And in a note with this tribute, she quotes an abolitionist friend who rejoiced that Emerson seems to have arrived that at the necessary dispositions of heart for the prosecution of the cause. Despite Emerson's own ambivalence about the speech, those radicals whom he had previously disdained, Brooks assured him, now claimed Emerson as one of their own. A year later, moving to the last example, 
of her networking. In November 1845, a scenario played out that plainly shows us the wide reach of Brooks's network. For years, Emerson had been among the speakers at the New Bedford Lyceum's annual lecture series. On learning from Brooks, though, that the institution's curators had recently adopted a segregated seating policy for Black visitors, Emerson canceled his appearance there that year. Many studies have credited Brooks for accomplishing this scheduling change, but the process by which she did so showcases her at the hub of a carefully nurtured network. First, abolitionists in New Bedford immediately spread the word about the racist policy. On hearing of the disgraceful Lyceum vote, Caroline Weston, who lived in New Bedford, let Wendell Phillips know that she was taking his advice to contact Brooks. I have written a full account of the matter to Mrs. Brooks and hope that Mr. Emerson may be disposed to refuse to lecture to the Lyceum under these circumstances and that he will let the curators there know his reasons. Emerson did as the abolitionists desired, sending his objections to the New Bedford Lyceum secretary. This vote quite embarrasses me and I should not know how to speak to the company. Besides, in its direct counteraction to the obvious duty and sentiment of New England and of all free men in regard to the colored people, the vote appears so unkind and so unlooked for that I could not come with any pleasure before the society. The curator answered, and though he rationalized a bit and tried to explain the policy's purpose, he agreed to withdraw your name from the program, albeit so unhappily. Brooks jubilantly informed Weston of their victory. I made Emerson acquainted with the facts relating to the New Bedford Lyceum. Mr. Emerson indicated that he had received a statement of the expulsions of the colored people from their accustomed privileges of being received as members. If this statement were true, he could not lecture before the body. Thus, the case now stands. I sincerely rejoice that Mr. Emerson has taken this stand and every friend of the colored man will feel deeply grateful to him. A few days continued yet more correspondence about the incident. Weston reported having informed Mrs. Brooks as Mr. Phillips advised, while Brooks proudly confirmed Emerson's decision. You may say from me that Mr. Emerson will not lecture before the Lyceum. I hope the report will go forward into every corner and crevice of New Bedford that Mr. Emerson will not lecture before the Lyceum because it treats those for whom it should care for above all others with scorn and contempt. In concluding the affair, Brooks relayed her gratitude to Emerson with perhaps a subtle hint that she expected his continued alliance. I wish the simple words I thank you could be made to convey what I as an individual feel for the part you have acted in this manner. As it is, God will assuredly bless you. A few years later, Wendell Phillips made very clear his perception of Brooks's power. I have wondered to see how the ablest and influential men are brought at last within the circle of this holy influence. There is Concord now, where Ralph Waldo Emerson lives, a man famous both sides of the ocean and wielding by his pen a wide influence. I believe we owe all his interest in our cause to Mrs. Brooks and her half dozen friends. They have worked long, but lawyers, ministers, and all have been obliged sooner or later to bend to their influence. In another gesture that would have thrilled Mary Merrick Brooks, it was Phillips who gave the eulogy at her funeral in 1868. As I conclude, it's important for us to acknowledge that not all of Brooks's efforts with Emerson succeeded. The New Bedford Lyceum episode occurred in the midst of abolitionists' call for disunion, which was Garrison's controversial movement advocating Northern secession from the slaveholding South. 
disunion petition circulated widely and Brooks was enlisted to obtain signatures to it in Concord. In February, 1846, she updated Mariah Weston Chapman that quote, we have got between 30 and 40 names. I have been laboring with Mr. Emerson. I have some hopes. When other townsmen refused to sign, Brooks turned her full attention to Emerson, hopeful that divine injunction and flattery might prevail on him to sign. I received the accompanying petition from the Boston friends that I should obtain signatures to it in Concord. And I said, Lord, send by the, whom thou will, but not by me. The command was obey. And so I went about it. She conveyed to Emerson that her son-in-law and the ministers had laughed about it. Her own husband, she admitted, treats it with contempt, thinks his wife a very silly woman to have anything to do with it. So now, thought I, Mr. Emerson must be applied to. He is a man who has faith in moral principle, who believes that truth will subdue to itself principalities and powers, and moreover, he has the soul in courage when he sees a thing to be right to do it. Now, if you, Mr. Emerson, shall see what is demanded in this, our trial hour, we shall be saved. If, on the contrary, you do not, I shall comfort myself that God sees it yet necessary to give to the world one more signal example of the awful consequences of an injustice and oppression. How did he resist? Well, he did. When the disunion petition appeared in the Liberator a few weeks later, it contained 24 conquered names, but Emerson's was not among them. These examples of Mary Merrick Brooks and her reform network reveal that social movements then as now, I would argue, often begin with unheralded individuals who light a fire under anointed figures. A vast repository remains to be mined by those who seek to find a richer and tell a more complete story about the groundbreaking work of reform among both the transcendentalist and in wider circles. And so the next time you visit, as I know many of you do if you're local, Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, and pay your respects to the hallowed figures up on Authors Ridge. And you find yourself standing, as we often do, right in front of Emerson's granite chunk of a tombstone. Please do me a favor and pivot 180 degrees. You don't even have to take a step to honor Mary Merrick Brooks, who even in death keeps Waldo Emerson clearly in her sights. Thank you. I'm going to shop, stop sharing screen now so that we can look at each other a little bit better. Okay. Oh my, that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Petrolianis. Please, Sandy, Shelly. <laughs> <Don't call Thank> <laughs> Sandy and I know each other, but I want to show my respect. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm just amazed. I that that Mary Merrick Brooks was such a driver in this important cause, and um, I think you got to it a little bit at the end about uh, how her own Mary's own husband was not respectful of her activities. Uh, but can you talk a little bit more? I mean, how was she given the independence to be so? Um, uh, and even strident in some ways, but she uh, she also was, it sounds like she was very charismatic the way she would work her network. Yeah, I, I myself would like to know more about how that marriage managed to um, be as close and intimate and apparently uh, loving and, and so forth as it was with such different views. But the way she describes it is that, um, he thought she was doing what she had to do. He said once that 
while he admired her cause, it simply wouldn't do. And by that, I think we can go back to Aaron and Warren Weston's um, comment in the beginning that I used that quoted her as saying he was as, as strong an abolitionist as his social standing would permit. And Anne Bigelow said something similar about the men in the community later when Edward Emerson um, did a wonderful interview with her talking about the Underground Railroad and the whole movement in Concord. She singled out um, Mr. Brooks and Emerson and a couple of the other men and said, you know, they were concerned about their social position. They had that to worry about. We women never. We were able to do what we wanted um, with this situation. And, and, and yet, it, it, you know, you can look at any marriage and imagine that that was difficult, especially since Nathan Brooks had a political career for a little while in 1838. Um, and while, you know, Mary was just getting underway in the real throes of her radicalism, he was trying to keep a very moderate political career um, moving. And he was also, of course, a well-known lawyer, respected figure in Concord. Um, but there, they had pet names for each other that figure in their letters. People who visited them always talked about um, the, the way in which it was just clear from their interaction physically with each other that there was a lot of love and that he thought the world of her. Um, oh. She could be a crusading, absolute pain. Um, they, she was stepmother to his daughter and they had their own son. Um, and when he drank too much in college, she wrote him a scathing letter because it had come to her attention that he drank alcohol. And of course, she was a temperance advocate. So when she found that out, she told him in a letter that she wished she had strangled him in his cradle rather than that he could have lived to be an adult who would do such a thing. So, I mean, we can regard and respect and admire this woman's drive. Um, for certain causes, but at the same time, it came out in some kind of distressing and, and uh, unhappy ways for those who loved her too. Oh, thank you. Now we've got some questions now. Um, I'm wondering, Carolina, would you like to give your question in person or would you like me to read it off the chat? Can you read it, please? Okay. <laughs> Carolina is joining us. She's our technical expert. Oh, okay, so Carolina's question. Despite the differences in the degrees of involvement of transcendentalists in radical abolitionism, would you agree with the following quote, the metaphysics of transcendentalism clearly contributed to racism? I, I am not an expert who can answer that by any means, but I certainly, as far as the metaphysics of transcendentalism, um, but I can say certainly that many of these devoted abolitionists, both the transcendentalists and the abolitionists who weren't necessarily transcendentalists, that the fact that they were so strongly anti-slavery did not mean that they were not also racist, some of them. Theodore Parker comes to mind, who obviously was a transcendentalist minister. Um, and there are plenty of comments in his letters and other writings that indicate his racist views, um, just like the ones we saw to Emerson. And yes, someone is making, Carolina, at the uh, point about Orestes Brownson too. Absolutely. Um, I, I think we can see those throughout many of those correspondence um, letters and so forth. Uh, it's really the, you know, when John Brown comes along 15, 20 years from the, then, it, one of the things that's so striking uh, about him and, and William Lloyd Garrison to a little extent is the way they do um, expect and, and offer social equality to most of the um, African-Americans they're in, in contact with or who visit their homes as well. That's just simply not true of most of the transcendentalists. Very good. Okay, so we have another question. What spurred Mary Merrick Brooks to be so interested in the plight of Native Americans the Cherokee Nation. Was it just the issue of 1838 or does she have a longer history showing empathy and interest? Uh, because we usually hear about her anti-slavery actions. I'm not aware of other interest or focus on Native American issues. Um, 
don't remember anything in her other letters other than these two to Congressman Adams on that subject. Um, certainly the fact that this petition was circulating in Concord had come to the women's attention, the men's attention, uh, attention made it, as you say, sort of the issue of the moment. And, and as she says in the second letter, you know, she's apologizing that their attention, the women's attention has been uh, moved, uh, you know, to the, um, to the slaves entirely, and that therefore they felt like they were coming late to the subject of the New Echota situation, because the treaty was signed, I think, in 1835, and they're protesting it, and these petitions are moving forward only in 1838, because that's when the Trail of Tears was, was underway, and it was definitely going to happen. So we have uh, another question, and I want to encourage any of our attendees to put a question in either the chat or the Q&A. So uh, here's another question. Uh, Lydian Emerson was a staunch opponent of slavery. That's, that's Waldo's wife. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on whether she also played a role in convincing Emerson to join the anti-slavery cause? Yes, she absolutely did. And um, Phyllis Cole has written a couple of articles on that subject, um, giving you sort of almost a beautiful day by day, year by year situation of the way in which, to his great dismay, uh, his wife's, I think uh, the phrase is that his wife continued to grieve over the wretched Negro and the perils of the Middle Passage. So it wasn't this easy, um, immediate conversion, but his wife absolutely kept that issue in front of him. You know, Mary Merrick Brooks lived down the street and could pound on the door and be respectful and had to call him Mr. Emerson as she approached him. But Lydian made it a part of their home every day. And um, as I said, Phyllis Cole has written about that extensively. She's also brought out uh, the important role too of the aunt in Emerson's life who was always instrumental and important, Mary Moody Emerson. She didn't live in Concord full time, but when she was there, she was absolutely from about 1835 forward, what we would call a Garrisonian abolitionist. So between her and Lydian Emerson, and his neighbors. Waldo Emerson really couldn't escape this, although he managed to do a pretty good job of it for about a decade. Let's see. So Sandy, would you say it took about a decade for Mary Merrick Brooks to twist Waldo's arm or at least get him to, to uh, speak publicly and take a stand? Maybe not quite that long. Um, I'm thinking of a decade being the early 1830s when Prudence Ward and her mother moved into the you know, thorough household, became permanent boarders there in Concord. And with that relocation, they started bringing the liberator into everyone's home because they subscribed and they had already been pretty adamant garrison supporters when they lived in Boston. Um, so they helped, I think, energize the whole community, Brooks among them, but the female society was not founded until 1837. The Middlesex County Society, though, had been meeting in Concord and nearby from 1834, 1835, and Brooks was part of those meetings, as were, I think, Henry Thoreau's sisters at that point, too. So yeah, I would, I think the decade's fair because, you know, mid thirties, uh, give or take a year, but it's August 1st, 1844, that we can really draw the line, even though there is, as I, as I said, um, some disagreement about how strong that speech is on August 1st, 1844. Nonetheless, it's the first considered lengthy address that he gave against slavery. We've got another question. Uh, can you talk more about the other women she mentioned? you mentioned in the talk, uh, the Weston sisters, mm -hmm. et cetera? How did they get involved? Were they abolitionists first? And then they met uh, Mary, Mary Brooks, or was she friends with them and brought them into anti-slavery? Mariah Weston Chapman was the leader of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, and that organization had been founded ahead of Concord's 
I can't tell you the exact year. Um, I'm thinking 1832, 1831. It was shortly after Garrison started publishing The Liberator in Boston on um, New Year's Day, 1831. And I don't know, I should know, but I don't, whether Brooks had met her ahead of that relationship between the two societies. I'm thinking not. Um, my guess is she met these abolitionists at the local county meetings that she went to. And then once she knew them, she started the letter writing and, and the friendship developed from there. Um, we don't have Mariah Weston Chapman's letters back to her in such numbers. But luckily, Mariah had these abolitionist sisters who happened to live in these outlying places. And Warren Weston, her sister, is the one I mentioned who visited Concord. And she's kind of visiting these outlying communities to, to drum up, to proselytize, to be a missionary for anti-slavery. And so the, the, the starting of these women's anti-slavery societies in these local communities is exactly what the Boston women want because that brings money in to help fund what they're doing. And the, the women's societies really bankrolled um, Garrison's ability to be able to publish The Liberator along with other abolitionist funding. Um, Caroline Weston, another sister, again, lived in New Bedford. So she was able to get involved and report on that dimension. All of their letters are in the Boston Public Library. And in fact, there's a, a biography of the Weston family that was published five or six years ago now um, that, that was really good. And we need more work on them and on, I mean, to have all of those letters even digitally available would be wonderful. And I don't know that there's any project underway to do that or not. I haven't heard of any. Great, thank you. All right, we have another question uh, or a comment. Uh, thanks for your wonderful book and the elevating of Mary Merrick Brooks. Can you explain a bit more about the racist attitudes of many of these transcendentalists? I know in your book, you mentioned uh, Agassiz visit to Emerson and also Franklin Sanborn uh, and Harriet Tubman. How do you suggest to deal with these issues when teaching or interpreting this period of history? Well, how to deal with it in teaching is, is you know, never an, an easy situation, um, but it's always one that the students handle far better than you think they're going to. And that's because I think what I'm learning at least year by year from students, especially as they learn less and less about this whole subject in their secondary education, they're grateful and they're thrilled to be finally learning something that they always knew they were not getting, that they should have learned at the, at the lower school levels. And I'm learning that already just this year in the first four weeks of the semester. Um, but yeah, I mean, Sanborn um, had some very ugly things to say in the way that he described Harriet Tubman, um, you know, um, offensive language in correspondence, and, and yet he valued her very much, was thrilled that she came to Concord, regarded himself as John Brown's, you know, right-hand man, certainly there in Concord. It was thanks to Frank Sanborn that John Brown came to Concord in the first place because the women had asked him to invite him. Um, Louis Agassiz is, is um, somebody who of course is um, admired by every transcendentalist, I think. Certainly Emerson was a good friend and his daughters went to their school, uh, but it, it's a subject that I felt compelled to bring up in the book at least, that it just shocks me. I'm not sure how you do it, that one day, night of the week, you're entertaining Louis Agassiz, who has just some despicable views about race, and, and not just on the subject of race, but specific individual people whom we knew that Ed Emerson admired. And then, you know, the very next week you're entertaining John Brown. I'm not sure how you do that. Uh, but Emerson, you know, he viewed his friends, I think, through a separate lens. I mean, Thomas Carlyle in Britain luckily stayed in Britain and didn't come visit Emerson ever. So he was never exposed to this conquered community that would have excoriated him for his absolutely, you know, 
objectionably horrific racist views. And Emerson knew about those views and attitudes. Of course he did. But, um, it, you know, I think there might be one or two letters in the correspondence between them where Emerson takes a slightly different tack and tries to talk a little bit about race, uh, it, not in any preaching advising way, but simply laying out that his views are different and he understands Carlisle feels differently. I haven't read those letters in a long time, but it, it, it is absolutely certain that he knows uh, the, the views that, Con that Carlisle had. So, wow. I, I, I don't know how to tell you that, that it's something any of us can ever get comfortable with because we can't, but um, you know, it, it, that's not necessarily what we're supposed to do with history either. Thank goodness, uh, we don't get comfortable with it. We just keep trying to dig into it and dig into it and get more and more of it out there so that the generations who come after us have a fuller picture. And um, it's, it's certainly not to make us feel good. But when we get to bring people like Mary Mooney Emerson back out of the margins and into the center, um, it is rewarding. So there, there's good stuff that you can do as well. Well, thank you. I, I just wanted to, uh, again, recommend this book. Uh, it's got such a wealth of information in it, Sandy's book, uh, to set this world right. And uh, it is, isn't it amazing we have such a wealth of archives, uh, you know, and we can go back and look at this history, you know, with new eyes. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And, and thank you, especially to our speaker. And I've just pasted in the in the chat box uh, Sandra Petrolinus's email address. You could see that, and and she has said that she'd be more than happy to answer more questions later on. And then to remind you that we have uh, our next event is Saturday, October twenty second, three p.m., uh, and it's part of the Concord Festival of Authors. I've put the link there, and it's an um, in person and a live streaming and a recorded event and free of charge. And then we also have one November 14th at 7 p.m. online with Dr. Sarah Ann Wider. So thanks again for coming and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.